All right, Barb, we are all set to go. Okay, let me get this off the screen now. There we go. Okay, so here we go on pollinators. Remember that you can email me if you want to. I apologize for not having checked between last week and this week. I'll try to remember right after uh, we're done today to check my email in case anybody had any questions from last week or this week. Okay, and here we go. Maybe. Uh, Galen, I'm having another problem now. It's not um, Scary screen. there we go. OK, so very briefly, I'm going to mention other pollinators that aren't insects, but I won't really discuss them. And then we'll start right in talking about different kinds of insects that are pollinators. The, the most important ones are the bees. Everybody knows about butterflies, but there are a lot of other insects that are pollinators that everybody doesn't know about. So again, hopefully you'll learn something today that you didn't already know. So if you look at the whole world, you Hang have on, Barb. the most- Barb, we are, yes? seeing your, we are seeing your presentation. Did you share screen? Okay, let me see if I can get out of here. And um, okay, all I have is a picture of you. I don't have any way to share my screen right now. And you're right, I forgot to do that. Are you on the Zoom? You're on the Zoom interface then? I'm on, uh, yeah, I see your picture, so I'm still on. Okay, but I so don't see at, the, at the bottom. At the bottom, do you have prompts at the bottom? This It'll say like mute, start video, security, participants. You see that? Uh, at it should be a green. Exit minimized video. Here we go, I think. Oh. Okay. Okay. Now let's see if I make this big. Um, okay. Share screen. Okay. And should... I apologize, everybody. Um, let me go ahead and go back. Okay. So here we are. I don't know how to get rid of that thing up at the top. Is there a way to do that? Well, never mind. Okay, so uh, you already heard me say I was going to mention, but not discuss non insect pollinators. And then we'll talk about the insect pollinators. If you look at um, the whole world, you see insects, of course, you see birds. There are mammals, some as large as lemurs that are pollinators, and there are reptiles such as skinks. But those, uh, the mammals and the reptiles don't pollinate. None of the species are known to pollinate in Virginia. So if you look at the US, again, you have insects, not as many as worldwide. The birds are cut down to only hummingbirds. We don't have sunbirds or the other bird pollinators in the US that there are in, say, Africa, Australia, et cetera. We do have some bats in the Southwest that are pollinators of night blooming plants. Those bats are not in Virginia. Our bats are insect eaters and they don't go to flowers. Um, so in Virginia, you do have still a wide variety of insects, not as many as worldwide. And then the only hummingbird that we normally have during the, the season when plants are blooming to be pollinated is the ruby throat. We do see every now and again some um, accidentals during migration, uh, other kinds of hummingbirds. Okay, so I don't know why I'm having trouble changing slides. Um, Galen, can try you ex try exiting out of your share? And then um, try to put your PowerPoint back in the PowerPoint um, presentation mode. Okay. What? Bring the PowerPoint forward. I'm sorry. What do you mean? Um, are you in? Are you? Is your uh, PowerPoint presentation in presentation mode? Yeah. Okay. Now um, try sharing screen again. Okay. Or actually, are you able to move your your slides? just in PowerPoint mode without sharing screen first. Um, I don't think it, that worked either. Let me, let me see. 
where I am. Here's the power. Oh, you want me to try it without? Yes. Is it working that way? Um, can everybody see that screen? No, they, no we're just we're, we're just seeing the group. But can you see the PowerPoint yourself? Okay, on your let screen? me try to put share screen again. And here we go. Now, should I just try it this way? Or should I try to put it in presentation mode again? It worked last time. Try presentation mode. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Hopefully we've got it now. Uh, and everybody can hear me and see the screen, right? See my screen? I can see some of you nod if you can hear me and see me. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so insect pollinators. Notice that these data are from a very old 1898 paper that was cited in 1982. Now you might say, why did he cite such an old paper? Because back in those days, people did natural history and they just went outside and made a lot of observations without pulling things into the lab and trying to do experiments. So they really um, gathered a lot of information on the natural world. People aren't doing that sort of thing. Scientists aren't doing that sort of thing so much anymore, at least in this country. So these, these data then, um, can't remember where this study was conducted, but 47% of the insects that visited flowers in this study were hymenoptera, including uh, wasps and ants, as well as bees. 26% were flies, 15 beetles, 10 uh, lepidoptera. It might surprise you that more flies and beetles visited than butterflies. But butterflies, in the grand scheme of things, are not quite as important pollinators as flies and beetles for many, if not most, plants. And there are some other uh, pollinators as well that we probably won't have time to talk about. But almost any insect that's fuzzy enough can be a pollinator, as long as it's moving from flower to flower. OK, so as you all know, there are some flowers that can pollinate themselves called self-pollination, and then anything, wind, water, insects, mammals, et cetera, that take um, pollen from the anther of one plant and land it on the stigma of another plant or another flower on the same plant are cross-pollinators. So that last slide, you may have noticed it said flower visitors, not pollinators. So what's the difference? The visitor has to actually aid pollination. There are a lot of uh, insects that will go to flowers to drink nectar and or eat pollen, but they have to be big enough to touch the anther and the stigma. So little tiny things, depending on where the nectary is, may be able to get nectar out of the flower without ever touching the anther. And then it's irrelevant if they touch the stigma on the next flower. So in some cases, they're big enough. In some cases, they're not big enough. If they're going to eat pollen, they they can't eat all of it, or they're not going to pollinate the next flower. You know, if they're if they're getting it all over themselves and then just sitting there and eating it off before they move on, then they're not going to pollinate the next flower. And they must be hairy enough to pick up pollen because that's what picks up the pollen is the body hairs. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Okay, so you may or may not be aware of pollinator syndromes. And pollinator syndromes are these traits of flowers over here on the left that actually attract different kinds of pollinators. So here you see bats, which are of course mammals, and the rest of these are insects till you get over here to wind pollination. Now I'm gonna do a little aside here for a moment. Goldenrod is a great pollinator plant for late in the season, but it has a bad rep as causing allergies. Goldenrod does not cause allergies. Ragweed, which blooms at the same time as goldenrod, is a wind pollinated plant, uh, as are grasses and many trees. So things that are wind pollinated have pollen that's light enough to be up in the air, and that's what you're breathing in that causes your allergy. Insect pollinated 
uh, plants normally don't have that much or that light pollen. Now, in the case of beetle pollinated things, think um, magnolia here. The magnolia is a very old tree and beetle pollinators are the oldest insect pollinators. Um, so the magnolia tree does have a lot of pollen, but I don't think anybody is allergic to uh, magnolia. All of the other ones, except for bat pollinated flowers, which we don't even have here, have limited amounts of pollen. And in the case of goldenrod, which is pollinated by bumblebees and other bees, as well as maybe other insects. The pollen is not only limited, but it's sticky. So it's not up in the air. If, yeah, if you stick your nose into a goldenrod flower, it might give you an allergy. But if you're just walking around breathing normally, it won't. So uh, pollinators are attracted to color. They're attracted to scent. Uh, the scent is closely related to nectar production. So if, we, if a flower smells good to us, it's probably producing nectar. The pollen uh, is not as easily told by us, but the bees have these things called um, pollen guides, which means that the flower looks different under ultraviolet light. Bees can see ultraviolet, and it basically shows them where the nectaries are and where the pollen is. The flower shape will also um, be different depending on the pollinator. So bats and beetles are not really good at utilizing um, plants with corolla tubes like uh, butterflies and, and long-tongued bees are. I'm not going to carry on about this entire slide because it would take the hour, but the pollinator syndrome Will, will pretty much tell you what is likely to pollinate the plant. I will tell you that bees will, will, will go to any flower that is blooming, depending upon what other flowers are blooming. Perhaps they prefer these colors. I've seen this a lot, but you can see bees on red plants as well. You won't so much see butterflies um, on a yellow plant as you will on a red one, but you'll see bees on whatever is available to them at the time. And I'll talk more about that later. So how do you tell pollinators apart? Bees have four wings, as you can see here, two on each side. Flies have only one pair of wings, one on each side. Unfortunately, for trying to tell bees from flies in that way, because some flies are bee mimics and look very much like bees, um, bees have a row of little hooks called hamuli that hold together the front and the back pairs of wings. So when they're flying, the wings are held together. And unless they're dead and dried out, the wings don't usually separate. A, a really good way to tell a bee if you're not afraid to get too close is that the antennae have an elbow, as you can see clearly in this bottom slide. So all bees have elbowed antennae. Sometimes they hold them out so it can be hard to see. Now, the branched hairs, which are the defining characteristic of what is a bee versus what is a wasp, are microscopic. So you're not going to see those. But when you see a bee with pollen all over itself like this, you can be pretty sure that it has branched hairs. It's not a wasp. Wasps do have hairs and they can pick up pollen, but not this much. This bee additionally has what's called a scopa, which is a pollen gathering apparatus uh, made of very stiff, large, and very well divided hairs that are particularly adapted to holding pollen. And this is a typical place for a scopa to be. And we'll talk about honeybees and their relatives a little later. Okay, so now is are these wasps? Are they bees? Wasps also have four wings. Bees are also descended from wasps, so they are very wasp-like. However, if you see something with a big, long pedestal here between the thorax and what you think of as the abdomen, uh, it's pretty sure that it's a wasp. Bees do have the wasp waist. They're pinched in here. You can't see it because they're so hairy, and you can see it easier on the wasp because they are much less hairy and they don't have any branched hairs. And I just stuck this in here because some of these slides have a lot of information on them. So um, 
if you want to hear a bumblebee sonicating, doing buzz pollination, you can put your ear six inches from that bee and you're not going to bother that bee at all. On the other hand, if you want to get honey from a beehive, that might be a problem for you. So the social bees will sting around the nests. A bumblebee will not sting you when it's on a flower. If it lands on, I've never had a bumblebee land on me. I have had sweat bees. Maybe you have as well. But if you get agitated and start throwing your hands around and try and push them off, then they might sting you. But normally, uh, bees don't sting. Okay, so how do you tell a fly that looks like a bee? These are both flies. Well, in these pictures, you can see pretty clearly that they only have two wings, not four. However, they're not going to sit still for you. These are pretty small insects relative to the size of these pictures. They do have two wings. They have short antennae. This one you can see really well. Those are the antennae. Okay, here to remind you is the elbowed antennae, and that's a honeybee. Another difference between uh, bees and flies is flies usually have pretty large eyes on the front of their face, whereas bees' eyes are pretty much on the side of their face and they're not usually as large. Now, I put this in here to remind everybody to be very careful of websites because if you're not an expert in the area, you can easily get confused by some of these things. This was a website talking about bees that the blogger had found covered in pollen. This is not a bee. Look at those antennae. Look at the number of wings here. Look at the size of the, well, the size of the eyes doesn't look good. Yeah, it's all covered in pollen because it's a bee mimicking fly, pretty good honey bee mimicking fly if you didn't look at it this big, you know, if it's the size of a honeybee, you know how big that is. So be careful of the information that you get. Be careful of the websites that you are using to get your information, particularly medical information. Okay, so uh, wasps are not as good pollinators as bees because they don't have those uh, divided or feathery like hairs. However, Look at all these wasps with pollen on them. All it takes to be a pollinator is to be able to get the pollen on your body and to carry it to the next plant without eating it all before you do so. Um, and even something that doesn't look like it's very hairy or picking up a lot of pollen like most of these on this slide. Heather Holm is an expert on pollinators, uh, particularly Hymenoptera. She has a new book out on wasps that is in the, the last slide uh, on references. So I trust her that this bee wolf, which yes, they do eat bees, uh, but they also drink nectar, which means they could be a pollinator. They're way big enough to get pollen on them while they are um, drinking the nectar. However, remember the fuzziest, uh, the fuzziest insects are the best pollinators. Okay, one of my pet peeves, uh, people, when they think of bees, they usually think of honeybees. Honeybees are not even a native species to this country. So they were brought in and they are good pollinators for some things, not as good for others. I, I in, in getting ready for a, a bee social that we're having over at the Clean City Commission for the Bee City Committee on July 20th at 2.30, if you're interested, you're invited. Um, but you need to contact Wendy Isles to register for that. Uh, at any rate, then we're going to have this social and we're going to have fruits and vegetables that are pollinated by bees at that social. So a little education along with some food. So native plants and animals, what are they? There are things that people have not moved around and they evolved, if you're not afraid of that word, evolved in place. Okay, so they are where they've always been, even though their range might expand or contract a little bit. Uh, and Jamestown, I, I think Jamestown probably had honeybees. I'm, I'm not a historian, so don't uh, don't take me to task on that one. But it was brought the honeybees were brought by European settlers. Most of the other bees in this country, not a hundred percent, we'll talk about them later. Uh, but most of the other ones are native. 
Now, the other thing, if you think when you think of a bee, of honeybees, honeybees are social. They live in these big colonies. They go from year to year. They interact with each other. 90% of bees in this country, which are almost all native, are solitary. They don't interact with one another. Even if they nest in the ground and they, they kind of aggregate their nests like those big cicada killers, which are wasps, not bees, of course. Um, they don't interact with each other, okay? Each female builds a nest, lays her eggs, and or feeds the young. Um, so don't think of a honeybee-like thing when you think of bees in general. Now, this list on the left of food that's pollinated by insects came from this organization and I thought they were pretty good until it occurred to me to look up almonds because I knew that um, beekeepers take honeybees across the country to pollinate almonds when they're in bloom. And honeybees, because they can have up to 50,000 bees in a colony, it's a pretty effective pollination mechanism. However, almonds are not native to this country. So it would make some sense that a non-native bee might be as good a pollinator of that plant as a native bee or even better. Although almonds, if I remember correctly, come from Asia, not from Europe. And, and honeybees are basically native uh, to Europe, I believe. So what I did with this list was I highlighted in blue all the bees and some of them like grapefruit, it just says bees, and I don't know what that means. So I did it, uh, bold it. Everywhere you see bold is native bees. And so this information might not be complete. I probably need to go through it line by line and see what I can add. Some things like macadamia nuts, you see there are other insect pollinators besides whatever kind of bees this means. So how important are native bees compared to honeybees? They bees in general pollinate most flowering plants. Remember before Europeans brought honeybees over here, all of these flowering plants were getting pollinated. So the native bees were doing it and the other insects. Native bees can contribute 86% of the pollination that we need for the crops that are insect pollinated. And of course, in your home gardens, you can have beautiful squash plants and beautiful blossoms, but if you don't have any squash bees, you're not gonna have any squash. So keep in mind, if that's the problem, uh, if you're spraying pesticides, you may be doing in your pollinators. Honeybees can't buzz pollinate. So these plants down here that require, uh, they have what's called a porocidal um, anther. It's like a salt shaker. And honeybees may be able to pollinate a little bit, but the most effective pollinators of these plants are bumblebees and a few other smaller bees that can do this buzz pollination. What they're doing is they are basically vibrating their flight muscles inside their thorax very quickly. And you can hear this from at least six inches away. I don't, I don't think I measured it scientifically to see how far away I could hear it. But you can hear it with your ear. You can hear them buzz pollinating. And so bumblebees are very important to the pollination of some of the crops and some of the things in your garden. Okay, this, is, this one down here is my favorite non-native bee. Uh, when I was studying bees up at Mountain Lake Biological Station, in far western Virginia, um, it was cool in the evenings and bees frequently stay out on the plants overnight, particularly if it's cold. And one day I was out walking around the pond and I saw one of these guys, it was all covered in dew, it was too cold to fly yet. And I went really close with my camera trying to get a picture of it. And it opened these big jaws and threatened me with its jaws. I don't know if that's because it was a male, but these it's a member of the leafcutter bee family and leafcutter bees have pretty strong jaws. So it may be a uh, threat posture in all of them or just in this one, which is not native, came from Asia. And by the way, you don't want this for another one other than the fact it's not native because it pollinates kudzu, which is not everybody's favorite plant.
Osmia here is related to the blue orchard bee, but this is a non-native species. This one is pretty interesting. So um, economic entomologists had imported Osmia cornifrons, which looks identical to this one, except that it has two little spikes on its face. And that one was introduced on purpose, but these, since they look the same, unless you have a microscope, uh, accidentally came along with it. So it remains to be seen whether this is going to be invasive. This one was up, like I said, in Western Virginia. I'm not sure what the port of entry was into the country. This one, like I said, um, agricultural uh, entomologists brought in. Okay, so all these bees I've been talking about, everything is native somewhere. There are over 20,000 species of bees in the world. There are over 4,000 species in North America. And there are somewhere around 450, maybe a few more species that are native to Virginia. I got this number out of this uh, source. And this particular source said there were 19 species that were not native or exotic to Virginia. Now, this uh, young woman, not as young anymore, but uh, I met her when I was doing my research in the same area that she was. And she counted 485 species of bees in Southwestern Virginia. Uh, and now she works for Xerces Society. Uh, and if you Google either Bee City or Xerces, you're going to get some great information, a lot of good resources, fact sheets on pesticides, on pollinators, on, on everything relating to any of my talks that you could possibly want. And Nancy is working for that organization now after she got her doctorate. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the different kinds of bees in Virginia. I've already mentioned the squash bee. Most people call it the squash bee. Um, it can also be called the cucurbit bee because some people call, uh, call other bees squash bees. But these are pretty much specialist bees. We'll talk more about that later. So in this family, you have honeybees, bumblebees, squash bees, carpenter bees, sunflower bees, and the longhorn bees is a large group of different kinds of bees. And some of these are even solitary, okay? They do, they're the ones that have the specialized pollen basket, and I'll show you a picture of that on the back legs. If you see a bee where it looks like it has a package of pollen, it's usually shiny because um, the bumblebees and the honeybees mix it with nectar to stick it in this pollen basket so it doesn't um, you know, float away as they, um, as they fly away. Uh, so if you see something like that, you can be pretty sure that it's in, it's in actually two tribes, I'll show you that as well, of this family. Some of the members of this family are very small and some like the bumblebees and the carpenter bees are very large. And I'm gonna show you how to tell the carpenter bees from the bumblebees. If it has a fuzzy butt, it's a bumblebee. It looks like a bumblebee. If it looks like a bumblebee, but it has a shiny behind, it's a carpenter bee. They're in the same family. Um, they're about the same size, depending on um, whether you have a queen or a worker. A lot of worker bumblebees can be pretty small compared to the queens. And the carpenter bees can be a little bit bigger than most bumblebees. Male carpenter bees have this uh, cream colored face. And yes, this person is holding it, but males can't sting. Stingers on anything in the hymenoptera, wasps, bees, ants, are modified ovipositors, which is an, an ovipositor is an organ to deposit eggs. So of course, males don't have them. So no male bees can sting, and most female bees don't sting unless you're messing with them. Serotina is a very tiny bee that nests in stems. So any kind of a hollow stem or a pithy stem that they can hollow out, they might be staying in. So they're pretty small um, in the fall, okay? Hollow stems, galls, 
beetle burrows in rotten or solid wood, and of course, carpenter bees will uh, will tunnel in your house or your shed or your garage if it's made of wood. I read that they don't like painted wood, but then I had somebody tell me it didn't matter to them. They they tunneled through the paint anyway. If you see a bee patrolling, going one way and then the other way and then back, particularly like on a ridge line, those are the males patrolling territories to keep everybody away from their spouse. Okay, this is the leafcutter bee family. And the reason they're cutting these cute little holes out of leaves is because they will also nest in a stem, but they will lay an egg and then they will and lay an egg on pollen, a pollen ball. They will wall off each cell of the nest in the stem, the long way in the stem with these cut leaves. Okay, so that the growing larvae only eat their own pollen. They can't eat each other's pollen. Uh, they are unique among the bees in having their scopa on the bottom of the abdomen. So if you ever see a bee, the, the whole bottom of the abdomen is yellow, coated in pollen. That's because it belongs to this family. And all of these are solitary. None of them live in colonies. This is the blue orchard bee, which is actually raised for pollination of orchards. The andrenids are a very large family of bees. They're not as pretty as some of the others. They're called mining bees, uh, partly because I guess they, they nest in the ground. Excuse me, I'm having a dry throat issue here. They are also solitary. Some of them are very tiny. Here is the smallest bee in the world shown on the face of a carpenter bee. So this is Perdita minima. Sometimes the scientific names uh, really match the animal. And here you see, this, this doesn't look like separate pollen grains, but it is. And the giveaway here is it's not just in one big ball. So that's not a corbicula, it's a scopa uh, on this andrenid on this um, purple cone flower. Some of these guys carry the pollen on the back of their thorax. And what bees do is they groom themselves a lot. All insects do. You've probably seen house flies doing it. Um, but they can groom pollen that's in different parts of the body into the scopa so that they can carry it back to the nest to make a nest, make a pollen ball to lay an egg on. Now, this family in particular has a lot of pollen specialists, and we'll talk about these terms briefly later on. But be aware that these violets, if your yard is like mine, I have lots of volunteer violets, and those are specialist pollinator bees that pollinate those. So if you get rid of your violets, you're also getting rid of an andrenid species that might have lived in your yard. Because uh, native bees don't fly very far. Bees, honeybees can fly a couple of miles, but most of these native bees, particularly the small ones, don't fly more than a couple hundred yards. So if you don't have both a nesting spot and food for them in your yard, you won't have them. Okay, the next family is the Holictidae, the sweat bees. Everybody's heard of sweat bees. Again, they don't sting usually. I had one sting me on the back of my neck twice. The first time it happened, I thought it was just a stiff tag in my shirt. And that's how minor the sting is. The second time it happened, I knew something was going on. Uh, some of these are just beautiful. These are called green bees. This genus is green in front and has a stripe behind. This one is green all over, and there's another common genus that's green all over. Lazy aglossum is very small, not as small as Perdita minima, but it's, it's one of the smallest bees. And when you get them under the microscope, you can see this iridescence, but they just kind of look black if you just see them fly by or sitting on a flower. Um, and I'll show you some bees later on with mark, yellow markings on the face which is very common among bees, like the carpenter bees, there's a cream, but these yellow markings, some of the bees are quite striking black with these yellow markings. Helictids carry pollen on the legs. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of them doing that, uh, but there was one earlier with the bent antennae that 
that I did show you. Uh, most nest underground and most are solitary. So with some of these very large families, you can't just say one thing about them. So some of them will nest in things like stems and some of the halictids are actually uh, moderately social. Uh, this family, and here's this yellow face that I was talking about. This family is common, but there's only two genera that are common. So there are different species in the genus. These are actually much bigger. Hylaeus is, is really pretty small. They, um, again, make uh, nests in um, plants, stems, and so they smooth the walls of their nest cells with oral secretions, and they dry into this cellophane-like lining. They're all solitary, but some in aggregations. Um, a few of them don't even have a scopa, and they carry pollen in their crop and regurgitate it. And the last family, so there are, there are six. I'll, I'll show you something else that has all the families at once. But the melidids are fairly rare. They collect oil from plants on specialized hairs, and they include that for the larvae to eat and also in the nest lining. Uh, they're small to moderate size, fairly specialist foraging, because they're for only foraging, I think, except for nectar, on plants that make oils. And they're solitary in ground nesting. Okay, so let's look at these social, semi-social, and uh, solitary insects. Eusocial uh, to an entomologist means the truly social ones. All ants are truly social. All termites are truly social. Some bees, honeybees and bumblebees and a very few others, and then some wasps and, you know, the paper wasps and that sort of thing are truly social. These are the criteria to make them truly social. They have to cooperate in raising the young. They have anatomical casts, so the queens are always bigger than the workers. The males are a separate cast, for example. Although in termites, uh, a lot of the workers are males. And the division of labor goes along with the body structure. So the soldiers and the termites, et cetera. Uh, overlap between generations is that, as you will see, bumblebees are not as social as honeybees because they're, they're um, colonies only last one year. Okay, so social versus solitary. Three tribes in the apidae are truly social. Well, social and to some extent, I just said bumblebees weren't you social. Bumblebees, the subtropical and tropical stingless bees, which we don't have, and then the honeybees. So those, those parts of the family apidae are social. Within the halictids, a few of them are social. Uh, carpenter bees, not truly social. Don't interact, females do not interact. The males do not interact except to mate. And then here's another tribe of the apids down at the bottom left that we don't have here, uh, the orchid bees. We have orchids, but we don't have orchid bees. This family I didn't mention because they're not in Virginia, they're not in the US, they're not in the New World, they're only in Australia. Um, Caledids, the plasterer bees, andranids, melidids, megachylids, and then one subfamily uh, of the apids, which are cuckoo bees, which are what are called kleptoparasites. They don't even make a nest of their own. So they definitely don't interact with other members of their species other than to mate. They take over the nest of other bees, and um, they they either eat the eggs, kill the eggs, kill the larvae, and then they lay their own egg so that the, the supply of uh, pollen and nectar that were there would be for their baby, kind of like cowbirds if you're a birder. Okay, so here's what bumblebees do. And notice here the size of the queen relative to the size of the workers. Here's some eggs. And in here, you can see uh, some of these are for storage, and some of them, these are larvae sticking their heads up to be fed. Okay, stage one, in the spring, the queen emerges from hibernation, 
And that's when you see these really huge bumblebees because she is starting the colony all by herself. There are no workers. So she has to lay the eggs. She has to gather all the pollen and nectar to lay the eggs on and then to feed the larvae to lay grew up and pupated and came out as adults um, to help her with the next generation. And then at one time of year, the unfertilized eggs, which are male, are laid, and uh, then you, the, you have some of the worker larvae being fed like a queen to develop into new queens. And then the males and the new queens mate, and in the fall, the old queen, the workers, and all the males die, and the only bumblebees that hibernate are the new queens. And this diagram basically shows what I, what I had just said. On the other hand, here's a solitary bee cycle. And keep in mind that these bees only live a few weeks. So if they're specialists and you don't have the flowers that they're gonna feed on, particularly pollen, you're not gonna have them in your yard because they only live a few weeks. They don't have time to be flying back and forth like a honeybee or a bumblebee could. So the female builds and provisions the nest along alone, although they may aggregate the nests. It's the same basic life cycle in terms of the stages, although not of the nest. So here's a nest of a solitary bee with the pollen and nectar, the egg laid on it, the larva hatches out and eats it, it pupates, and then it uh, emerges as an adult that only lives uh, for a few weeks in the spring, summer, or fall. Remember that bees eat only nectar and pollen. None of them are predators. None of them are herbivores other than the, the nectar and the pollen, which actually aids the plant. And the leafcutter bees, you know, if you don't want them in your roses, I'm sorry, but they're not actually eating those pieces they cut out. They're using them to make their nests. All bees drink nectar to fuel their flight and their foraging. They're busy bees and they need a lot of energy. So they lap up all this nectar. And even the specialist bees take nectar from many different kinds of flowers. When you say a specialist bee, you're talking about the pollen that it uses, not the nectar. So the nectar has the sugars that fuel like the candy bar before or before or after the workout, I guess. Pollen has proteins and lipids and the young are basically raised on the pollen. They can chew the pollen with their mandibles and many bees are specialists on pollen. Now, remember that if the bees and the plants evolved in the same area, that's what they're used to, that's what they're adapted to use. Um, the generalist bees, which include the honeybees and the bumblebees, will drink nectar from other flowers. Chances are that they're not using the pollen. They might, but they, they can drink the nectar no problem. Um, but a lot of the generalists are the ones that use the non-native plants. The, the honeybees and the bumblebees have to keep the colony going. The honeybees all year and the uh, bumblebees at least through the growing season. And bumblebees love dandelions. Many bees love clovers. And you will see a lot of bees on the non-native weeds. Okay, so the pollen diet of bees goes from using only one plant species to using many species in many families. And monolecti, mono of course meaning one species, oligolecti is used from everything from one genus with several species up to, um, to up to two unrelated plant genera. We won't worry about that term, it's not widely used. And then polylecti is particularly important in those social species. And so if, if it's broad, then they're called generalists. Uh, here is a specialist bee, a narrowly oligolectic bee that only takes the pollen from hydrophyllum, and that is an andrenid. Here's another andrenid that's an oligolectic specialist on zizia and other uh, plants in this particular family. So 
uh, in terms of gardens, we have to think about not only what time of year it is, but what different bees like. You know, if you're on the flower end of it, you're not going to worry about that, but I'll talk about that more in the last uh, session. Okay, how do bees carry this pollen? The branched hairs, the scopa or um, corbicula. Here that you can see clearly that this is still fuzzy looking pollen. It's not smooth, it's not mixed with nectar, uh, and this is not therefore a corbicula as in a honeybee or a bumblebee. Uh, this sort and also behind the thorax underneath this overhang here is where most solitary bees carry their pollen, other than the leaf cutter bees, which do so under the body. Now here's Here's a bumblebee with a really good load. Can you see that does not fuzzy looking because it's got nectar mixed in, but the smooth area on their hind leg, okay, is, um, is where they pack this pollen and then these hairs help to hold it in. And the only ones that have it are the honeybees, the bumblebees, the orchid bees and the stingless bees that we don't have. And here's a nice picture of a leafcutter bee showing the abdominal scopa full of pollen. Okay, now this slide does have all of the families that we have. It doesn't include that family that's only in Australia. But look at the difference in the tongue. This is an extreme one. This orchid bee we don't actually have, although honeybees and bumblebees are considered to be long-tongued, as are the leafcutter bees. But within these families, there is a variety of tongue lengths. It's just the average tongue here is much longer than the average tongue here. And I wanted to show you an extreme uh, one. So that, that tells you that this guy cannot, uh, what is that? I can't tell you for sure what that genus is. But if you have something with a tubular corolla, that's a large, long tubular corolla, this bee isn't going to be able to drink nectar from it, whereas this bee could. So the, um, the Asteraceae, which I think I'm up on my taxonomy, used to be compositae. This guy loves that kind of flower because it can reach the nectaries. Okay, keep in mind that the more different kinds of nectar and pollen you are providing in your yard, the healthier the bees are gonna be. And of course, the flowering through the season. The long-lived colonies have to have uh, nutrition throughout the season, but the solitary bees only live a few weeks. And so they have to have something available and it has to be pretty specific in some cases uh, because their life cycles are timed to the bloom of the flowers that they're used to feeding on. Uh, okay, 30% of the species of bees in this area are pollen specialists, more or less specialized. So that's a lot, that's a lot of bees that are counting on us since their normal habitat is kind of gone now. Here's the squash bees again, Pipanapus purinosa, solitary longhorn bee in apidae, uh, and pollinates only pumpkin squash melons and other cucurbits. So you're not gonna see this guy in your yard unless you have some of those. And hopefully if you do and you don't use broad spectrum pesticides, you will see some of them. Here's one of my favorites, the spring beauty bee. Again, it's an andrenid. Uh, spring beauty, Claytonia virginica was one of the very common spring ephemerals at Mountain Lake Biological Station. And these bees are uh, specialized on there. I don't know if the plant has any other pollinators, but I do know that this bee doesn't take the pollen of any other plants. Okay, other pollinators. You know that most moths, with the exception of some of the hummingbird moths, fly at night. So this is the, um, oh, I always forget the name of this. It's a vine flowers at night. Sorry about that. But my cats used to love to watch these moths pollinating it through the 
through the uh, windows to the patio. Uh, yucca moths are the only things that pollinate yucca plant, just like the fig wasp is the only thing that pollinates figs. So some of these pollinators are very specific. And if you want the fruit, uh, you're not, probably not eating yucca fruit, but you might want figs if you have a fig tree. Uh, you have to have the pollinator. Skippers are usually considered butterflies. Um, and you don't know how hard I look to find you a picture of a butterfly with pollen on it. One of the reasons bees are better is they really get down and dirty in the flower, whereas sometimes these guys hardly uh, touch. And this one probably isn't going to have a lot of pollen on it when it leaves that one and goes on to the next one. Wish I could remember the name of that. Somebody, if you remember it, put it in the, um, it's, it's commonly sold in seed packets, night blooming vine. Uh, but you could put it in the chat for me if you remember it. Okay, flies are important pollinators. We have talked about the surfids, which are also called hoverflies or flower flies. Did you know that male mosquitoes drink nectar? Uh, I don't know that they drink anything else. Um, they're not getting a lot of protein, but then they probably don't live that long. Uh, in the insect world, males are basically to, poll to pollinate, to, to mate with the females, and the females usually live longer than the males. Um, bee flies that are pretty good bee mimics. Uh, this is a blue bottle fly. You may see these, uh, Califorid, you may see these around garbage, but they also are uh, pollinators. Those robber flies we talked about as being mighty predators are also pollinators. And these are not all of them. These are just a sampling of some of the flies, although possibly the most important ones are the surfids. Beetles. Again, the first, um, the first flowering plants probably had big open flowers like the uh, magnolia tree. And so beetles here, this one is on a rose. I think that's probably goldenrod. I don't, you know, don't, don't keep me about what, um, what kind of plant these are on, but look at all, I don't even know what kind of beetle that is, but look at the pollen on them. I had to show you this picture because it shows the way that some insects get pollen on their bodies. Now this ladybird beetle is down there. I think she's drinking nectar, but at any rate, this flower is putting pollen on her with that anther as she ducks in there. Some of these guys, not very hairy. Well, neither is a ladybird beetle. So remember, the hairiness usually indicates how good of a pollinator. And this one is a good example of where one stage is a pollinator and another stage you don't want, because this is a locust borer. And they, the larvae do bore in trees, and nobody wants that. Okay, so uh, this time the references are right in here. I'm not going to go through them other than to say that uh, this is one of the heads, Lee Mater. Uh, I think, yeah, the newer ones, he's calling himself Lee Mater. I don't know if he got married, uh, but in the earlier ones, it's just Mater. But these are Xerxes sponsored. Uh, and then Heather Holm, I talked to you about. You, Gretchen Laboon is a serious scientist. All of these things are authoritative, so I would trust what they say, okay? And they're all paperbacks with colored photos. And there we are. There's a whole group of people, evidently, that post pictures of bumblebee butts. I didn't know that until I was looking uh, for photos for this presentation. Okay, are there, there aren't a couple of questions unless somebody posted the flower for me. Moonflower, yes, that's it. Thank you, ladies. Um, moonflower, there are some things I just blank out about, and that's one of them. Now, are there any questions? I really kind of talked the whole time. We've got five minutes. 